Good evening, Baruchim Abayim Rabotai. Welcome to another edition of our Thursday night's class. Tonight's class was sponsored by Lilu Nishmat, Ben Asher Ben Yimah Shalom, Tein Afshar Tzua, B'Tzua Chaim, B'Gan Eden Ayon, Im Kol HaTzadikim V'Chasidim, Amen V'Amen. The Havdil, I don't like saying these things in the same sentence. If uh, for all of us that I'm assuming read Tehillim every day, there's a wonderful Jew who's a doctor and a very big Balchesed who's done a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of great things for the Jewish nation. Who's currently not doing well uh, in a hospital uh, under the COVID climate in a different state. And he needs a bigger Fuash Lema. So have in mind in your prayers, Yaakov ben Simcha, Hashem should take him out. Ma'afilah la'o gadol and he should be healthy soon. Bezrat Hashem. Yaakov Ben Simcha, an easy name to remember. It's a Jew that Ami said, Lo Zakarat Atov to. He's done a lot of good things. Somebody who I trust, who's like a brother to me, told me what an amazing person this is, and we should all uh, have him in mind in our prayers. Anyway, so, in the spirit of the three weeks, um, as we've done in all the years, we're going to maintain the consistency on taking the optimistic approach to life because pessimists don't really get anywhere. So it has to be that in all the uh, pain and suffering that Kali Yisrael went through in Galut and the biggest pain and suffering, Tzal HaShchina, the Borei Olam's Tzal HaShchina, there has to be something behind it that's deeper than just the shallow discussions or the Tisha B'Av events. I hope this year there'll be no Tisha B'Av events for many reasons, but one of them is that there won't be Tisha B'Av, it'll be Yom Tov, the event will be a big party. Because it says Hashem's going to turn around all our fast days into Yemei Simcha Be'ezrat Hashem. But uh, in life, in general, this is a very gen bit large generalization, it's just to make a point, people are willing to pay a consequence based on return. Meaning, if somebody was to come to you and say, work 16 hours today instead of eight, if he's not offering you extra money, you're obviously gonna get out of it if you can. But if he's offering you triple overtime, uh, that's uh, pretty quickly would say yes. Everything in life is like that. Depending on what you're being offered is how much effort are you willing to pay or even how much of a personal price you're willing to pay. I have friends, for example, that are in the textile business. So most of the year they spend between Italy and China and here and there, well now, I don't know if you can go anywhere, but on normal days. And it's very hard for them. They don't see their wives, they don't see their kids. It's a great sacrifice made. What's the rational justification? They make a good living and they need a good living. So it's Kedai in their mind to make the sacrifices. I'm not saying if it's right or wrong, it's not my business. But as an idea, it's Kedai in their mind to make those sacrifices for the sake of whatever outcomes and comforts and whatever else it is that they obtain as a result of what they're doing. And like this we know in everything in life. On a normal day, if I come to you and say, lift 150 pounds for me, you're gonna look at me like I fell off the moon. What, why? But people go and pay money to go to a gym to pay a trainer to lift 150 pounds. Why? Because again, reward versus effort. It's worth, they wanna <coughs> be rigged and have a six pack and do mathematical equations on their chest. And as a result, it's worth it for them to pay a trainer to lift heavy day. That's the way the world works. So Adkan, I think we all agree, right? This is normal, this is understood, this is a very simple way of going about things. Now, let's put ourselves into a more godly perspective of things. Hashem paid a very heavy price. Shafach hamato aleitzim valavanim. He had anger, whatever that means. God doesn't have emotion. He doesn't get angry. It's just a parable. But whatever that means that he had anger, he spilled out on etzim vavanim, on wooden bricks, meaning he destroyed the temple, which was a great sacrifice. He destroyed his own home for the sake of salvaging the Jewish nation, that nothing bad should happen to the Jews in comparison to what otherwise maybe could have happened. God forbid, we should never know what that means. Not only that, for over 1950 years, he's paying a very, very heavy price. His name is desecrated all over the world. People have been making kilag vakele sainu bagoyim, or making a mockery out of God and out of his children. And that's a very heavy price to be paying. There must be a great reward 
that he's calculating, or a great accomplishment that he wants to obtain, kaviachol, that's worth it to pay such a heavy price. So what, what is that? Um, and how do I become part of that? If Hashem is willing to pay such a heavy price for something, number one, we have to identify what that thing is, and number two, we've got to be part of that thing. So that's our little seek for truth tonight. So I want to begin by quoting a Rambam in Shmona Prakim in Perek Dalit. Shmona Prakim is the part of the Rambam that normally boys don't really know exist and girls know very well. Because the Beis Yaakov system does a phenomenal job of getting girls to memorize Shmona Prakim. So the Rambam in Shmona Prakim writes, I'm quoting word for word, Pa'ami many times, Itu b'nei adam People make a mistake in these actions. V'yachshavu achad ma'akzavot tov u'ma'alami ma'alot ha'nefesh. And they think that something is good, an end, an end means an extreme, is something very good to do or something very positive. Sometimes they'll think this is good. The other end is good. Do it this way, that way. And they're all wrong. Anybody who's on the extreme of any spectrum is automatically wrong. Who's the one who's praised? The one who finds the middle road. We don't like extremism. Not to the good, not to the bad, not to anything in between. The middle road. The middle road. And to be on the middle road, meaning to be average, that's where a person has to put his energy and focus to obtain. That's the level that you want to obtain in life. When, for how long in your life, maybe there's a point that you go past that. The Ramam writes, Tamid, always, throughout your entire 120 year journey. Ad shi'it matzu, until he gets all his character traits and everything about him to be with, grounded to the middle way of doing things. Of course, there's a lot of depth to this Ramam besides for uh, the way I'm breaking it down on a shallow level. But pretty much what the Ramam's pointing out is extremism is dangerous. Okay. I want to ask a very simple question on this Rambam. Mela, somebody who's an extreme evil person, it makes a lot of sense. Bad enough that he's evil, on top of that extreme evil, that's a, that's a mass murderer. That's not a question at all. But what about if somebody's going to the extreme good? Why is that not good? If anything, that's really somebody who's our hero. And it seems like the Rambam felt that extremism in all areas is not good, period. And we have to understand why. Now, of course, extremism doesn't come from a rational place because anything rational is very grounded. Grounded things aren't extreme. So by definition, that's the real answer. But to delve a little further for the point we want to make tonight. Everybody wants to do mitzvot. Some people not only want to do mitzvot, even goyim lavdil, good deeds. I want to be a righteous person. Something some goy today, a doctor I know, I asked him for a favor. He said, sure, I'll be there. I said, what do you mean you'll be there? You're not in the hospital? He said, no, I was home already, but I'll go back. It's okay. I said, no, I'm sorry, doctor. That I didn't mean to ask you for. He said, it's fine. I'm also allowed to do a good deed once in a while. Even a goy. It's a human nature by healthy people. Unfortunately, some people aren't so healthy, but uh, by healthy people, to want to do the right thing, and to even want to walk an extra mile to do the right thing, or to make society a better place. Even amongst those that consider themselves uh, the progressives and the, these people, that their Id ideals and values are definitely warped to a sad extreme, even amongst them, there is a certain amount of Good, just in a very distorted way. The environment is important to them. I don't know what, saving dogs' lives is important to them. They'll kill people, they'll kill cops, they'll this, uh, everything's okay. But uh, some cat on a tree, they'll be busy saving for 10 hours. But that also comes at the end of the day that Hashem made a person that deep down inside, somewhere there's something sympathetic, empathetic, and some norm of wanting to be good and to do good. That's the way the world is created. 
as Torah observant Jews, and even if you don't consider yourself one, as soon to be Torah observant Jews, because the Torah says, Gvarifticha Torah, she Israel chozrim bitshuva umiyad in migalim, whether we like it or not, at one point we're all going to be Torah observant Jews. So some are already, some are soon to be, but one way or the other, Am Yisrael is all doing tshuva in a happy way. And that'll merit us to see Mashiach soon. So of course, we want to do mitzvot, as many mitzvot as we can. When the Chofetz Chaim, Zechat Tzadik V'Kadosh Zubachas Chotei Agin Aleinu, wanted to promote the value of learning, so he wrote a lot about the importance of learning Torah, but he also wrote what it, we'll call a bribe, a mental bribe. He said that learning Torah, if you need to encourage yourself when it's hard for you to learn, you should know it's a priceless thing. Because he made a calculation that the average person could speak 200 words in a minute. And when you learn Torah for a minute, you now got 200 mitzvot said in one minute alone, just for learning a minute of Torah. Then he went and said, imagine you're learning Torah uh, when it's hard for you. So Chazal say you get at least 100, maybe 500, or even 1,000 times reward for that. Now if you add on Shabbat, the Benishchai has some sort of calculation, how Shabbat, the uh, mitzvah on Shabbat is worth a thousand times during the week. So you can get millions and millions of mitzvot for one minute of learning Torah. That was his intellectual bribe to people to want to spend time learning Torah. This is a discussion, by the way, that's sidetracking completely in the poskim, if it's only, listening to Torah qualifies the same way or not. Could be it's only active learning, proactive learning, but one way or the other. Definitely a beautiful thing. Um, I only say that not to downplay all those that listen to Shirei Torah all the time. It's more that if you're already sitting and reading your Gemara, so, or learning your Gemara, why not say the words out loud and then you'll cover all grounds for everybody. And it makes you a holier person as well. Now, as Jews, we're very business oriented. We like making minimal investments and getting maximum returns for our investment. So minimal investments in Judaism I'm not going to promote, because obviously that's against what I believe, so I can't say what I don't believe. But maximum returns, that I will promote. So the Alta from Slabotka, a legend, went and did a little bit of an overview of the 613 commandments to see which mitzvah can you get the maximum return from. And when return, I'm not talking about paradise. I mean, in relative to the effort that you're making, you're obtaining the most mitzvot by doing that mitzvah. And the Alta concluded an interesting thing, which is the theme of tonight, and is really the response to what we call the three weeks. The Alta says it's very simple. We have to quote a pasuk, the pasuk, every last person in this room knows by heart. It's in Chumash Vaikra, Perk Yutet, Pasuk Yutchet, that part you might have not known. Ve'avta, L'reyacha kamocha. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Meaning, be a loving person. Love society, love mankind, definitely love Jews. Comes the Rambam in Ilchot Deot. In Perek Vav Halacha Gimel. And the Rambam writes, What does that mean, Ve'avta l'reyacha kamocha? The Rambam was a Halacha book, not a Shkafa book, a Musa book. The Rambam wrote Halachot in Yad HaChazaka. Mitzvah, there's a mitzvah, a kol adam, on every person. Le'ehov et kol echad mi, ve'echad mi Israel to love each and every Jew. Kegufo, like himself. Which, by the way, the Ramam teaches us that there's a big mitzvah to love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you won't be able to love others. Ve'avtal re'acha kamocha, first learn how to love yourself. That's, that's a step in the right direction. And then, if you love yourself, you'll be able to love others. And loving yourself doesn't mean to become an egocentric maniac or a narcissistic lunatic. That's not loving yourself. That's an ill person that's dangerous to himself and society. Loving yourself meaning is being able to validate who you are and your value in the world and your purpose in the world. Comes the Rambam and writes, Mitzvah al kol adam lehov kol echad verechad misel ki gufo shene'emar Like it says in the Basuk, ve'avta l'reacha kamocha. When the Ramah had to explain his explanation of the Pasuk was you have a mitzvah to love each and every Jew. And the love that you have for each and every Jew is an individual mitzvah. Okay. If that's the case, let's go on a little journey to understand what this means. And maybe we'll then be able to go back to what the Alta said 
that when he calculated the Tayag Mitzvot, which one you can reap the most dividends from in comparison to its return, it's this Mitzvah of Aftalarecha Kamoch. Comes the altar from, from Kelim and says this. It was the altar from Slabotka that we quoted before, now we're quoting the altar from Kelim. Altar just means old, meaning the Saba, that was a nickname. They were, that was one of the nicknames of Rashi Yeshivot, the Torah leaders. Ein Daval. I'm quoting word for word from the writings of, from the Alta of Kelim. There is nothing in the world. Shal Yadovit through it. Yuchala Adam Lekayem. A person can be Mekayem, can obtain, can keep, observe. Kama Alafim Revavot Mitzvot. Tens and tens of thousands of mitzvot. That's just an example, it's way more. Kol rega verega. Every fraction of a second. Ela be'ahavat habriot. To put on tefillin for a man from bar mitzvah to 120 every day is a very nice thing, a very important thing. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. But it takes time to put it on. It has to be kosher. It takes time to take it off. You know, there's a lot of effort involved. And if you did it, and you did it right, and then, then, you got an extremely critical mitzvah. Comes the altar from Kelim and writes, if you love a Jew, then for every millionth of a second that you love him, you get a regular mitzvah da'oraita, just like you put on tefillin. You kept Shabbat. So you, kept, you got one mitzvah, extremely important to keep Shabbat. Everybody has to keep Shabbat. You got one mitzvah. Here, every fraction of a second that you loved another Jew, you got another mitzvah da'oraita, just like Shabbat, just like tefillin, just like kosher. Ela be'avat habriot. He doesn't even write it about Jews. He writes it about mankind at large, just by loving people. Al kol ish ve'ish mi Yisrael shu'ev v'chol rega v'rega, and on every Jew kal v'chomer that he loves every second. Who mitzvah bifnei atzma? It's a separate mitzvah. It's not one mitzvah. I love somebody, so I get one mitzvah for my whole life. Emotions change very frequently. Our moods change by the quarter of a minute max. That's in the best case scenario. Those are for the stable ones amongst us. You can talk to somebody. He says hello with so much energy, and three seconds later, he's in the worst mood, as if he is dying tomorrow. But uh, so every second, your mood changes. So if you still love every, a Jew. The next second, it's another mitzvah. You get another mitzvah. And that's why, and listen to these words, they're critical, especially for this time. When the Yitzhah has to pick a fight with people, what's the fight that he picks with people? That they shouldn't love other Jews. Because then he knocks out his ability for drastic amounts of mitzvot in a fraction of a second. Hear what's going on here? The Yetzirah has to gauge. He doesn't have unlimited energy. He has a certain amount of energy that he has within him that he can, or power, we'll call it, that he can put around the world. So he can either fight with you on some in individual sin, that by doing that will get you to do one sin, or convince you not to do one mitzvah, that would take up half your day, and by doing that, he convinced you out of doing that one mitzvah and eliminated you from doing that one thing. Or, he could do something else. He can instill in you hate to another person. Or not even hate, resentment, dislike to another person. And then he took away from you tens of thousands and millions of mitzvot just from that one individual alone. Just that one individual alone. Imagine the whole Kal Yisrael. That's the Alter writes. People ask, what does he mean that the temple was destroyed because of sinat chinam, baseless hatred? That's a reason to destroy the temple. If anything, the Gemara says, Avodah Zarah Gilui Arayot and Shfichut Damim. It's true, Avodah Zarah Gilui Arayot and Shfichut Damim are very severe sins, but they're individual sins, and there's only that many times they can be done. Baseless hatred can be done all day, every day, unlimited. So the calculation of sin or of loss of mitzvah, is so much greater. Very, very quickly. In order to understand this, I, we, I want to quote something that from Abchaim Brim, Zechet Tzadik V'Kadosh Levachas, Chotay Agen Aleinu, it should be a militia shana sum shamayim. Abchaim Brim, I knew personally. I learned with him, personally, privately. He used to quote a Baal Shem Tov, many, many times. 
And he used to call this Baal Shem Tov to answer, how could it be that a Jew doesn't love another Jew unconditionally? He was on such a high level that to him it was simple that everybody loves everybody no matter what. There's no questions asked. He, he couldn't fathom, it didn't register in his brain that it's possible to be a concept that a person doesn't love another Jew. So he looked for a way to explain it, to rationalize it in his holy mind. And he found the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov quotes a Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, the Fa'inei Amud Alev, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that a shochet, if somebody slaughters an animal on Shabbat, he could be chayav mishum tzoveya. Not only in order to kill, which is one sin on Shabbat, to kill an animal, to slaughter an animal, also the blood, if it spilled on a fabric and he had an interest in it or whatever, in some situations it could be a, another issue of dying a piece of fabric. All right, I'm not getting into the halakha elements of that gemara. Of course, there's much more explanation beyond the, to the technical element of the halakha. Came the Baal Shem Tov and says, who's the shochet? Who's the ultimate slaughterer of this world? He said, the shochet's the etzahara. He comes to slaughter us all, our evil inclinations that want to destroy everything good in us. Not only for the Jewish nation, for the world at large. Yetzirah is what destroyed the world. If we got to a point that a chief of police in New York City can be sent to a hospital over brutal idiots that will throw things at him and harm him just because he's a chief of police, when this man gave 21 or 22 years of his life straight to protect those same idiots that went and did what they did, then there's nothing left. Society's bankrupt. And literally, society's bankrupt. That, that's... That was the final straw of bankrupting society forever. When I was raised and we saw a police officer, we were taught to go say thank you for your service. That's the way I was raised. Not to go throw things at him. And not to talk bad about him. Are there bad apples in every group? Yes. And therefore what? 99.9% .9 are not. And Dafka us as observant Jews at a time like this, where law and order is disrespected, should go out of our way to thank law and order. We should literally go out of our way to make it a point to thank them wherever we see them. Because these are people that at the end of the day are doing a job that you and I would not want to be doing. I know when you're 10 years old or 12 years old, it sounds cool to have lights and sirens on your car. All that's cool until the first time you're in crossfire in the Bronx somewhere. But at that point, nothing's cool anymore. When kids are young, in Israel, they dress up like IDF soldiers. It's a nice thing. When they get older and they're in the IDF, they realize that costume wasn't so simple after all. They're crawling in Gaza and this, and risking their lives, not knowing if they're going to see their mother again. These tzaddikim, these righteous soldiers that we have to pray for, that Hashem should protect them. Suddenly they realize that costume was cute when I was 12. Now it ain't cute. I want to get home to mommy one day. I want to make it back in one piece one day. The Yetzirah succeeded to slaughter anything ethical or anything of value left in this world. Chazal say, we quoted this in the past few weeks, if there's no law and order, people will swallow each other alive. There's no bound, some of these people have no boundaries. I was once in Tel Aviv in an office that I worked at the time, and I came downstairs and I wanted to go to the parking garage of the building and to get my car. It was the end of the work day. I was going to go back to the hotel I was staying in. And uh, I see a bunch of police officers there, and they say, I'm sorry, you can't go into the garage. I said, but my car is here. i got to get it out. They said, we're not going to disillusion you. It's going to take until at least tomorrow. Take a cab. So I said, what happened? I'm entitled at least to know that. So they said, you really want to know what happened? It's embarrassing to repeat. I said, we can't say too many details because we're in the middle of an investigation. But... If you want to know, we'll tell you. Your car's here. It's your building. You're entitled to know. One guy went downstairs and saw another guy parked in his parking spot. Got angry, waited for the guy to come back, and stabbed him in his head. Killed him on the spot. Over a parking spot. In a building that I worked in in Tel Aviv. Crazy. Baruch Hashem, they weren't from Bnei Israel, They were from our cousins, Bnei Ishmael. But, yeah, that's what happens. If there's no law and order, then why not? He took my parking spot. That's against everything. But this is not mankind's doing. This is the Yetzirah's doing 
that he goes and promotes these values to destroy society. To spread a terrible virus at one shot. And no, I'm not referring to COVID-19. The other virus rioting against police is a lot more dangerous than COVID-19. A lot. No. Comes to Baal Shem Tov and writes, One day God's going to bring Mashiach. And when God's going to bring Mashiach, we read this in the Agadah, the end of Chad Gadiyah, Vata, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Veshachat Lamalach HaMavet. God's going to come to take vengeance against the Yetzirah. He's going to come to slaughter him. And he's going to come to the Yetzirah, and he said, look how much sin you caused in the world. I want to get payday. I'm coming after you now. And the Yetzirah is going to go to God, comes to Baal Shem Tov and says, and he's going to tell God, God, what do you want from me? I did nothing wrong. I was an angel. And you created me to cause sin in the world. All I did was I did my job. Is the Yetzirah right? Yeah. That's what Hashem created him for. Did he do his job? Yeah, he did his job perfect. Too good he did his job. I wish he wouldn't be able to do his job so well. So what's God going to tell him? We're in a dead end. Comes the Baal Shem Tov is going to say, and says, Hashem is going to tell him, you're 100% right. To be a shochet, to go kill people, to go cause harm to people, to go cause people to think in stupid ways and do stupid things, that was your job. That was 100% what you were created for. That's fine. But shochet chayav mishum tzoveya. If you would have went to the people and said, go do sins, then I would have agreed with you. But being that you went to the people and told them it's not a sin, it's a mitzvah, you're doing a good deed, you colored it a different color, you painted the picture differently, you're a fraud, a fraud, that we're getting you for. Comes up Chaim Brim and he said, when I say these words over, I have literally chills in my whole body. I remember as if it was today. He held my hand. I brought down many svarim. I said over the story many places. So many mechabay svarim brought down this story. Amongst them a wonderful, wonderful two-volume set that I got recently called Midot Dilei. Um, and he said an unbelievable thing. He said, which mitzvah or avera is the Yetzirah the biggest tzoveya in? Does he know how to cover up for or fake the best? What's his number one success story? It's very hard for him to take driving on Shabbat and make it a mitzvah. Won't work. It's very hard for him to come and take, uh, I don't know, a killing and turn it into a mitzvah. It won't work. So which, which mitzvah or aviyah could he wipe out very quickly and make it look like it's a mitzvah? Came up Chaim Brim and looked at me and said, Yaakov, listen good. You know what the Yitzhah's only real power in this world is? to eliminate people from being mekayem the mitzvah ve'avta l'reacha kamocha and to promote sinat chinam. Because that he can make into a mitzvah. He's not religious enough. I can't go to his house. You just lost millions of mitzvot ve'avta l'reacha kamocha. Nobody told you you have to eat there. Maybe you can't eat the food there. But you could have went, you could have showed respect, you could have showed love, and then you wouldn't have that problem in the first place. Because when you show people love, they show you back love in the biggest way in the world. That one, he's a bad guy. We have to talk about him. We've got to oust him. He's dangerous. He's very successful at that, the Yitzhah. <coughs> and hate, forget about it. There's no end. I'm less involved in American politics because I have no interest in them at all. Um, but unfortunately, I have to be involved to a certain extent in Israeli politics. Not because I want to, but I made a promise to Egdol Torah that I will be involved as a strategic analyst for, to a certain extent. So I hear some of the big stories of the week on a weekly basis. And it pains me to no end to see the amount of baseless hatred that's going on in Israel right now. For weeks, the media is selling a narrative that the COVID-19 spread in Israel is happening as a result of the Haredi communities, B'nai Brak. When actually, if you look up the stats, the vast majority of positive cases in a condensed area is Tel Aviv. But God forbid they won't say that. Baseless hatred. I can't. I hate him. 
How am I going to deal with them? And on the flip side, I'm not one-sided. It pained me even more because I hold our community to a much higher standard than, that, than the media outlets. To see film of young children screaming at soldiers and police officers that came to enforce whatever the health guidelines are in Israel right now, which I'm not here to discuss if they're right or wrong. That's not my business. I'm not an immunologist. I don't talk about things I don't know. And these kids are yelling at them, Nazis. Are you crazy? Are you sick? Do you even know what the word Nazi means? That you're able to say that to somebody? And they're equally wrong, except that in our community, we have to hold a much higher standard because we should know better. So even though the action is equally wrong, God has a complaint against us in a much stronger way. This can't go on anymore. Because as long as this goes on, the Yetzirah is winning in the biggest way possible, and we are losing, and it makes no difference what we're doing. We could have all the Torah in the world, which thank God we have, and all the good deeds, and all the Tehillim, and all the Perek Shira, and it's not going to work. It's not going to help. Because if we can't love each other, that's where it stops by Hashem. He doesn't look even further than that. And if we do love each other, even if Lo'aleinu Ami is up to the worst things in the world, Hashem forgives and looks away. Because Avat Yisrael is the foundation of being a Jew. You can't have a house without a foundation. It collapses. If you built a hundred-story building, but there's no foundation, is it worth anything? One day later, the whole thing crumbles and kills everybody around it. You could build an empire of mitzvot. But if it's not based on the foundation of a pure Avat Yisrael, loving every single Jew unconditionally no matter what, no questions asked, You'll come after 120 and you'll get a big shock. You think you're coming with these billions of mitzvot and it's going to be empty the basket. You say, God, what happened to all my mitzvot? They say, they're all there, but there was a hole in the cup. It all spilled out. They say, what was the hole? They said, the hole was called Avat Yisrael, Sinat Chinam. You hated a Jew for no reason. You didn't love Jews. I'm not a Navi. And it's not a compliment to be an Avi, and Avi means a prophet, because as I said many times, the Gemara says that today, since the temple was destroyed, Nivua was given la shotim ve la I don't want to be in either category. And nor am I a So I'm not saying this is a fact, I'm just sharing with you my feelings, they may be totally wrong. But I think that one of the many things that God was saying in this whole COVID mess, which we thought we were starting to see an end to, and now we realize it's not as simple as we thought, is that we were at a point, at one point, that a Jew couldn't hug another Jew. And that was God's way of saying, you don't want to love him? All right, stay away from him. Social distancing. You don't want to be social? Stay distant. And I, this, this I say with full confidence, because I heard this from many G'dolei Yisrael that are alive, including one that passed away from COVID recently, before he died, that if we would have had Avat Yisrael, COVID would have hit the whole world, but no Jewish community would have been touched. Because Avat Yisrael is the greatest shield that protects us from everything. There's nothing it doesn't protect us from. And that's why the Yetzirah will do anything and everything in the world possible just to make sure that a Jew doesn't love another Jew. Because over there he lost. And the Yetzirah likes winning. He doesn't like losing, unfortunately. And he's good at what he does, too. Okay, but today there's a trend. So we did a little Hasidut, Baal Shem Tov. Now the trend is Kabbalah. So let's do a little Kabbalah also. Why not? How I go with trends? They say, can't beat him, join him. That's the trend. We're going with it. One of the greatest Kabbalists documented was Reb Chaim Vital. Zechat Tzadik Levacha. He wrote a sefer called Many Sfarim, but amongst them a sefer called Sha'arei Kiddusha. HaGaon Rab Chaim Vital, in the sefer Sha'arei Kiddusha, in Chedek Bet Sha'adalid, writes like this, and again I'm quoting, and I purposely am bringing the quotes word for word because of the importance of every word. Ve'avtal re'acha kamocha, the mitzvah ve'avtal re'acha kamocha, ve'lo od, not only that, she'al mitzvah zu amru, on this mitzvah, and he quotes, it's brought down in Torah Kohanim and Parashat Kedoshim. Sheze klal gadol ba Torah. That's a big rule in the Torah. 
comes Rab Chaim Vital and writes, Shekula Tluyaba. The entire Torah depends on Ve'aftal Re'achah Kamocha. Now listen to this, but before I quote the rest, I want to just bring it out to you. If we take a little survey now and I say, Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest prophet at least that ever lived. The greatest Jewish leader of all time. What made him great? One's going to say he brought down the Torah. The other's going to say that he fasted for, for three times, 40 days and 40 nights for the Jews. Another one's going to say that he went up to see God face to face and made it back alive. Right? These are all the things that we're going to say. He saved the Jews from Egypt. Right? Saved three million lives at least from Egypt. They're all qualified answers, no? And that's probably the ream of things, and that's where it'll end. Rab Chaim Vital writes, V'lo zacha Moshe. And Moshe Rabbeinu didn't become Moshe Rabbeinu. Not for any of those reasons. Those were all after. They were perks. Why did he, why did he merit the chol ma'alotav to all his great levels that he got afterwards? Ela she'aya ohev li Israel, Because he loved the Jewish nation. Umitzta'el b'tzaratam. And suffered within their pain. When another Jew told him he was suffering, he suffered with him. It wasn't just something that went through one ear and went out the other ear. Like it says, by the way, in the Pasuk, Moshe vayar b'sivotam. On that, Rabbi Kotla Zetzal writes, Vayigdal Moshe, what made Moshe great? Vayitzeh lechav, that he went out to his brothers, vayar b'sivotam, and when he, he saw their pain. He cared about their pain. He loved them. And he understood that they're going through a hard time. Vilachen, comes up Chaim Vital and concludes, Hayash shakul ki kol Yisrael. Why does Moshe Rabbeinu considered on the same spiritual level as all of the Jewish souls combined forever? Because he perfected Ahavat Yisrael. This is the man who brought down the Torah. This is the man who spoke to God face to face. This is the man who obtained the highest levels possible. Who brought the Jews out of exile. Who because of him we have something, who was willing to be wiped out for the sake of the Jewish nation continuing. And a list of accomplishments that just in the Chamisha Chum Torah alone we could sit here for hours and hours and talk about. And where Abchayim Vital, the great Kabbalist, had to summarize, what made him great? That he loved Jews. And that was the foundation of all greatness. Zichrut Torah Moshe Avdi, God says. Remember the Torah of Moshe. What Torah? Remember that in order to have anything to do with Torah, the first thing you have to be is Moshe Avdi, is to love Jews, like Moshe Rabbeinu loved Jews. And if you don't have an unconditional love for Jews, then we're in trouble. It's a big problem. But it's more than that. When a Jew doesn't show another Jew love and affection unconditionally, no matter what he's doing or what he's up to in life, he pains God in a greater way than any other sin in the whole Tayag Mitzvot. In the Tanat Veliyahu, at the end of Perich Havchet, it might be worth looking it up inside. It says words that should be a wake-up call to all of us. This is what God told the Jewish nation. My children that I love. Klum chasalti davar she'evakesh mikem. Did I ever withhold anything from you? That I can't ask from you something? I gave you everything. The only reason why your heart's beating is because of me. You're alive because of me. You're in this world because of me. Everything's because of Hashem. He gave every, Hashem gave us everything. Umanim vakesh mikem. What am I asking you? Hashem gave you everything. What is he asking you? A long list of mitzvot, no? Comes the Tanah de and says, Umanim vakesh mikem. What's he asking you for all the good he did for us? That you should love each other. When Hashem comes with one request to the Jewish nation, the one request is, love each other. The Ramchal writes words that's very hard to understand. Because God's love for us is eternal and unconditional. But I'm going to quote the words anyway just to show the extreme that the Ramchal took this. It's at the end of Mesilat, in the end of the 19th chapter of Mesilat Isharim, the Ramchal writes, Eina Kadosh Baruch Hu Ohev, Ela Lemish Ohevet Yisrael. Hashem only loves one who loves the Jewish nation. V'chol ma sh'adam magdil ahavato li Yisrael, gam ha-Kadosh Baruch Hu magdil alav. 
The more you love the Jewish nation, the more Hashem loves you. Who are the real leaders of Am Yisrael? Today there's a lot of confusion and what's the criteria of being a rabbi. Who are the real leaders of the Jewish nation? Comes to Ramchal and writes, that Hashem wants a lot. The many leaders that Hashem would do very well without. He'd rather they wouldn't be leaders. Who are those? The ones that love Jews. That's the criteria. The more love you have for Jews, the more Hashem wants you in the leadership. The less love you have for Jews, the more God wants you away from leadership. And he gives a parable. When a person is a father, and he has friends, which friends is he going to be naturally, without him even realizing, feel closest to? The ones who show the most care, concern, and love to his children. Because the father loves his child more than anything. And anybody who loves his child, he's going to also feel close to as a result. HaKadosh Baruch is our father. And when he puts his love in the world, where does he put extra doses of love to? To those who love Jewish people more and more. And the more a person loves Jews, the more HaKadosh Baruch shows him love. And the Rambachal goes on over there to explain this at great length. The Alta from Kelim continues his idea that this is the way to obtain the most mitzvot by saying the greatest success that a person can have in this world is to stick inside of him a love of society, of humanity that never leaves. And that's the best way to get close to God. If you want to get to the Kirva, comes the Alta from Kelim and writes, the only way you could do that is through tov, it's through being a good person. A good person is a loving person, somebody who shows affection to society, who loves society. And then he continues on to saying that God says, emulate my ways. And if God's ways is the God of love and kindness and mercy, so that's our obligation to emulate those ways. How are we going to turn to God and pray? If you didn't pray Avitya tonight, tonight, and if not, tomorrow morning, and say, give us back Jerusalem. When he says, all I'm asking is they should love each other. You're not even willing to get along. What, Jerusalem? Just get along. There's an old tale that obviously never happened, but unfortunately it could. The Mashiach decided to come. And he went into one shul, and he wasn't wearing a mask. And they told him, sorry, over here you can't come. You're a roidif. Get out of here. You're not wearing a mask. Then he went into another shul, and he was wearing a mask. And they told him, oh, you're dressed like Purim, over here you can't pray, go find somewhere else. Then he went into a third shul, and he was Hasidic. And they told him, oh, in Williamsburg they didn't have social distancing, you can't come into our community. And then he went into a fourth shul, and he was Chabad, and they told him in Crown Heights, they believe the Rebbe's Mashiach, if the Rebbe's Mashiach is still alive, if he's still alive, we're still holding in the 90s. So there is no COVID, so you don't belong here at all. And the Rebbe's Mashiach anyways, or whatever. And, then, eh, and so on. And then he went to the not religious and he said, well, Mashiach's a guy with a kippah, Haredi, definitely not. Uh, you're just a faker. And the media said, it doesn't, it, it, you don't fit our agenda right now. Have a good life. And he went back to God and he said, you're right, there's nobody to redeem. They're not interested in me in any way. Anyway. I turned to all Jews in all communities. And Baruch Hashem, we have a, a very uh, diverted community by us, so... In our case, we can't use a specific example. But if I'm speaking in a Hasidic synagogue, I turn to them and say, let's say Mashiach comes tomorrow, but he belongs to the opposing Hasidus of yours. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to go greet him or are you going to run away? <coughs> and I go to the Zionistic communities and I say, let's say Mashiach comes tomorrow and he belongs to Satma. What are you going to do about it? And I go to Satma and say, let's say Mashiach comes tomorrow and he's a Zionist. What are you going to do about it? And you could imagine the rest. I just gave a few examples and they weren't selected purposely. Recently I sat down with a guy to try and convince him the importance of supporting his son-in-law that's sitting and learning in Kol. I saw right away that he's a wonderful, wonderful person. He just was never taught. He doesn't understand better. And he told me, what, he's lazy, let him go work, uh, well, I have to support him, and all the other fancy words that we hear. So I told him he got it all wrong, and I explained to him for two hours that not only is he not supporting his son-in-law, his son-in-law is actually supporting him. The merit of his Torah is making him successful in business. I said, so I'm offering you a privilege. You don't want it, I'll support your son-in-law, gladly. 
I'm just giving you the last chance before I start supporting him. No, we sat for a while and it was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then he had a slip of a tongue, which I'm sure he didn't mean. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. And he said, uh, okay, I'll do it because uh, it's the right thing to do. Not for him, for my daughter. But I can't tolerate these people. And I told him, I want to tell you a story. And he said, what? I said, you know, I come from a lineage of very holy Kabbalists. So he said, yeah, of course I know. He starts telling me his grandfather knew my grandfather in Syria still in the 1920s, 1919, whatever. I said, so you know, you know, we have powers in the family. He said, yeah, I heard about them. Of course I didn't mean it, but I had to do what I had to do at that moment. So I told him, so listen to the story. This is between me and you only, but... I said, what? I said, last night Mashiach came to me and told me he wants to come. But he's a Kolel student, and he's scared that most of the Jewish nation won't accept him. And I got to get back to him tonight and tell him if he's able to come or not. Do you think we can accept the Kolel students so Mashiach should come or not? And he looks at me, and this is the beauty of the Tmimus of Asfardi. He looks at me, he says, Rabbi, Mechila, I'm sorry, I love my son-in-law. Yeah, just let Mashiach come. I said, and now Mechila, the story never happened, but okay, at least you love your son-in-law. It's so easy to say we want Mashiach to come. We don't want Mashiach to come. At least we just stop being liars. That's Mosif Chet al Pesha. We want nothing to do with Mashiach. Because 99% Mashiach is not coming from our crowd or from our community that we belong to. And then how are we going to accept it? We're in the opposition. We're in the other one. So there's only one way. Banai, cries and says, what am I begging of you? That you should love each other. And not just love each other in theory. That you should show proactive love to each other. We're in a situation in Am Yisrael that I don't know if the Jewish nation ever had as a result of this medical tragedy that's been going on, the people were isolated from each other. The average person in the world, even a healthy functioning person, and even somebody who had it relatively good in life, feels extremely lonely. And this doesn't discriminate between age, gender, religion, race, straight across the board. Suicide rates in the United States are up 43% sometimes week on week. That's frightening numbers. I hope they're not true and just being made up by the media. That's how frightening these numbers are. Because when people feel lonely, they look for any exit out. Now more than ever, it's our obligation to be proactive, to show care and love and concern and affection to each and every person in the world. No matter if he's my type or not my type, no matter if he's my style or not my style, let it be the gas attendant. Say thank you. And if you can afford it, give him a tip too. If anything, he should be respected more than most people today. He's not taking the cheap way out, sitting at home, even though he could go get a job and get 600 free dollars from a stupid government. He's working for less money than that, just to earn money respectfully working for it. He doesn't deserve a good morning. How's your day? Thank you. A dollar tip. Show love and care to people. And I use the gas attendant example just because of an incident that happened to me last night that was a wake-up call to me. I'm pulling up into town, and I like filling up gas the night, the night before, so in the morning, it's not another pressure on my head when I'm in a rush. And I stop at a gas station I normally don't use, so I'm not acquainted with the staff there. And I asked the guy to fill, it up, fill my tank up, and you know, I said, good evening, how are you? And I'm talking to him while he's filling up a gas. And he was very nice and friendly back, and he said, thank you for taking interest in my day, and, Whatever, and then I guess he decided I'm a good venting board. And he's a guy who looks like he's in his young 60s probably. And he starts venting to me. And he was a stand-up comedian and he had a good career and he tells me his name. I looked him up on the spot on YouTube and yeah, he had a really good career. And COVID hit and everything shut down and he had nowhere to go. And I guess he was, he was earning money in one way or the other that he couldn't get even proper unemployment <laughs> and whatever else he was doing. And he found himself pumping gas. And I wanted to show him some empathy, so I told him, it must be so hard for you. And he looked at me and he said, the first day I was on the job, it was extremely hard for me. But then when I saw how a little joke, that I always have something sharp to say off my sleeve, 
can make a difference in somebody else's day, it's worth it. It's a guy who's pumping gas. Obviously, he got a very generous tip. I got a few good jokes, but he got a very good generous tip. <laughs> I'm not in the comedy business, definitely not in the three weeks, so I'm not repeating them now, but I owe you one. <laughs> um, but uh, I was amazed. It was a wake-up call to me. I said, here's a guy who has every reason to be miserable and angry in his mind. He had a good career. He made an honest living. He was entertaining people night after night. He was doing everything in his world right. And his world collapsed on him. Now he had to take a job that I'm sure he never dreamt in a million years he'll ever do. And he's doing it. And not only is he not complaining about it, he found the positive in it. He has an opportunity to put a smile on more people's faces. Every person that you cross paths with today, you had the opportunity to put a smile on their face. Now do the math and decide whether I did that or not. And if you didn't, at least tomorrow, try harder. Whether it was your person in the morning that you bought coffee from, or your gas attendant that filled up your gasoline, or the receptionist or doorman in the building or company that you work in, down to your bank attendant if you happen to have to go to the bank today and put in a deposit. Whatever it may be, you had an opportunity to put a smile on somebody's face. And within your own circles, you came home tonight, you have brothers, sisters, parents, children, whatever it may be, you could have walked in smiling and said good evening and put a smile on their face too. Instead, you walked in storming, destroyed their lives and your ulama at once. Package deal. Was that really a good investment? I think that was one of the less intelligent investments. They say the stock market right now is extremely volatile. There's no value for anything anymore in the market. It's all inflated numbers. Judaism became very volatile too lately. Not much left. For a while there was no shuls, then there's no this, then there's no that, no yeshiva. At that point, God knows what, you know, there's nothing left. There's one thing that's always going to be there to stay, and that's what's going to bring us to Mashiach. No matter what goes on on a technical level, we can always still have love in our heart for Am Yisrael. And if we have love in our heart for Am Yisrael, if you love one Jew, it's millions and millions of mitzvot a day based on what the says. Now imagine you love the entire army, so I don't know how many Jews there are in the world, so I'm going to make up a number on the spot. 22, 23 million is my rough estimate, but that's made up completely. I'm sure tonight I'll be getting WhatsApps correcting me, and I appreciate them, by the way, because it's important for me to know the facts the way they are. I'm not talking about assimilated Jews, non-assimilated Jews. Um, but let's say it's 20 million, for example. If you have Avat Yisrael, you love 20 million Jews. Multiply that by hundreds of thousands of mitzvot for each Jew, each second, each minute, I mean. How many trillions and trillions of mitzvot do you do every day just from that alone? <laughs> Even if you lived 40 lifetimes with children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and kept all tayag mitzvot except for this one, you will never get to that number of mitzvot. And that's why the Yetzirah will not fight you not to put on tefillin tomorrow and we will not fight you to drive tomorrow night on Shabbat and he won't fight you on all those things because that's easy ones for him. He's going to fight you on finding a reason not to like another Jew. And he's going to look for every way, shape, and form. He's not good enough. He is good. We have a title for everybody and a label for everybody. Some people say, what do you mean? I'm not like that. I'm not judgmental. All right, let's do a little pop quiz. Somebody in your family, God forbid, you never know, is not feeling well. You need a blessing. You walked upstairs into the synagogue tonight. You're going to go over to the guy in jeans and call for a t-shirt. And no, I have nothing against jeans and a t-shirt. I wear them myself. It's only out of respect for the shul that I'm not doing it now. Or you're going to go over to the guy with the long beard and the white shirt. Are you judgmental or not? Super judgmental. But maybe that guy who you just judged by his clothing is actually the one who loves Jews and has more mitzvot than everybody combined. Maybe he's the one who doesn't talk Lashon Hara and as a result has less sins than everybody combined. Maybe he's the holiest of the holy. When the Balshento had to save an entire city from a terrible decree that was going to wipe them all out, he sent them to a drunk, to a person who was intoxicated whenever he was awake, and that was who was able to give the blessing. You know what's going on in heaven? You know whose blessing is high, holier than the other one? Al tiyeh birkat hediot kala be'inecha, Chazal teaches. Never think that a simple person's blessing is not important. It might be more important than all the blessings you can get. 
Besides the fact that sometimes exactly the layman feels your pain more. So when he wishes you well, it's coming from his whole heart. And when Hashem sees what's considered a simple Jew, somebody without a lot of mitzvot and without a lot of good deeds, putting so much heart into somebody else's situation, that's what he wants to hear more than anything. That's the best harmony and the best symphony to him. And that's the prayer that goes straight up to heaven. And we conclude with one more Baal Shem Tov story. The merit of the Baal Shem Tov Shri Yom Tikta Dinim HaShosh and all of us Bezrat Hashem. Baal Shem Tov was once going in the fields and he wanted to pray Mincha and a few times he stopped and he told his students he doesn't feel ready to pray Mincha. And then at one point he started praying and he said he feels that the prayers aren't working, it's not going up to heaven. And he was very scared. Mincha is towards the end of the day, it's the judgment hour of the day. It made him nervous. And suddenly he comes to the bottom of a mountain and he sees a child, a young child, cartwheeling down the mountain. Today with all the Xboxes, kids don't even know what it means to cartwheel, but there is such a thing, look it up. Um, and when he sees the kid, it was a Jewish boy, he waits for him to get all the way down on the bottom of the mountain, he gives him a big hug, and he says, thank you, now we could pray Mincha. And the students look at him like, Rebbe, huh? him? He's a kid who doesn't know how to read, who's a shepherd, who's out in the fields all day, who's cartwheeling, he's an acrobat. That's who you were looking for to pray mincha? That's the guy? What happened to all the big rabbis? Why didn't he go to one of them? And the Baal Shem Tov told them, all of our prayers are corrupted. We do it because we have to. We do it because we believe in it. We do it because we have an ideal. Some of us are holier, maybe. Not me, but others. And they do it because they have some connection with God that's very special. He says, but that's where it ends. This kid has nothing in this world. His knowledge of God is seeing the sky and hearing when he was a young child or a newborn that there's a God in heaven, whatever that means to him. And he stood on top of the mountain and then the Baal Shem Tov didn't want to say the story himself because he wanted them to hear it from the kid. And he said, what did you do before you went down the mountain? And the kid looks at the people, the students of the Baal Shem Tov, and he said, I knew that the Jews... The Jewish community that I'm part of prays at this time. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what praying means at all. He says, I put up my hands in heaven, to heaven and I said, God, there's only one thing in life that I'm really, really good at, and that's cartwheeling. That's my prayer. And I went down the mountain. And the Baal Shem Tov said, and his cartwheeling down the mountain went in Shemaim and did more than all the prayers of the whole army sailed together. And we're busy judging a guy based on the color of his shirt. How sick did we become? That's what we're busy doing, based on the culture, based on the size of his kippah or his hairstyle. Crazy. Crazy. Makes no sense. And this is what I could work once. But now, Mani Vakeshun, I'm only asking one thing. Shatiyu Avim, that we should love each other. How do you get to Avat Yisrael? That's a long discussion. But at least, let's eliminate sinat chinam first. Not have all this baseless hatred and have what to say and opinions about everybody. It's fine. Let's blow it all over and look for the good in everybody. And no matter who it is, you can find good in them. Even those who look very far from good. There's a lot of good there. I've been traveling much less lately because, you know, there's restrictions in most airports right now around the world that they don't like Americans so much, to put it mildly. But I spent 20 years straight of my life traveling around the world, and let me tell you, people are really good. Unreal. And even those that sometimes you think are so far from good, when you peel through one or two layers, you see diamond after diamond after diamond after diamond after di Unreal, just unreal. I'll end off with a story. This is a very old story, but that's why you probably don't know it, because it's been before the days of YouTube. Uh, or that I was on YouTube, at least. On one of my many journeys to Israel, and I say this story just because I'm saying it together with a prayer that Hashem should help that Israel should get safe again and open its borders and we should be able to go back to Israel shortly, healthy and happy. Um, yeah, the situation there got a little bit challenging in the past few days and we hope that that stops quickly in a good way. So on one of my journeys to Israel, I'm flying on an LL flight. And uh, yes, I'm a very patriotic person for the state, the state of Israel. And uh, if I can choose between flying an Israeli airline or a non-Israeli airline, why wouldn't I give the money to a Jewish airline? Even if it's more expensive, and even if their service is not as good. 
still worth it for me. So for years and years I fly, the whole, it allows a very small airline. Probably every employee there at the time at least knew who I was by first name. I mean down to the luggage crew and everybody, like everybody. I'm just a social person in that sense and I talk to everybody and say hello to everybody, they all knew me. And I'm on the plane and we're already like half an hour into the flight. I'm sitting in, in a comfortable seat and a flight attendant comes over to me and tells me, listen Yaakov, I need you to do me a favor, I'm sorry, I know you want to go to sleep probably and this and that was a night flight, uh, but I need you to get involved in something before we have to make an emergency landing. So I tell him, what do I got to get involved in? So he tells me the plane is full to capacity, in, at least in the economy. There's not one seat open. And we got in the middle of a row of four people. And there's one religious guy and three not religious girls. And I thought the rest of the story was going to be on the religious guy doesn't want to sit near the girls, because unfortunately there are stupid stories like that. Actually, this time the story was the opposite. The religious girls are not willing to sit near the guy. They say he stinks. <laughs> so she th he said, we tried switching him seats with somebody else, with this, that. They're making such a scene. It's uncomfortable for us as staff. They're embarrassing this guy for no reason. And honestly, they're embarrassing themselves too. You have a way with people. I don't know. You have patience for this type of stuff. Maybe you could go see what you could work out over there. I said, I'm on it. Let's go. Tell me the row number. He gives me a row number. I said, but don't come with me. Tell everybody to leave. Let me take care of it. I don't know. So I go. I walk over to them. And I smile to all of them. And I said, I heard there's a little bit of a dispute going on here and a discomfort in the name of the company Alal, as if I'm like their CEO or something. Uh, I would like to apologize. This definitely was a misunderstanding. And then I look at the Hasidic guy. And I say, sir, uh, unfortunately, the problem really is, is that you're sitting in the wrong seat. And he says, what do you mean the wrong seat? I'm willing to sit anywhere. I'm not making a fuss. There's nowhere else to sit. I said, no, you must have not read your ticket right. He was sitting in a seat, 43F. I said, F is first, first class. You're supposed to be sitting in first class. Right away, one of the girl near him was the one who was complaining and making the scene. Says, wait a second, I'm 42F. <laughs> I said, yes, really, you were supposed to be sitting there too. But unfortunately... Both of you can't do it because you don't want to sit together, so we only have one seat available. We're going to put him and not you. <laughs> suddenly the guy didn't stink, and suddenly he was fine, and in three seconds she was busy being all apologetic. And, it... and then I looked at them and I said, no, come on, girls. Don't you realize the problem here? What did he do wrong? Did he, did he do something wrong? If yes, I promise you he'll apologize. He looks like a very sincere person. But guess what? He didn't do anything wrong, because you have nothing to say. What did you do wrong? You embarrassed him for half an hour, if not more, in public. And he didn't fight back, and he didn't say a word, and he tried to be nice to you. Do you think he deserves an apology? i got to give them credit. That's why I say, all you got to do is peel the layers. One of them burst out crying. I thought, as it, God forbid, something happened. She was crying like a two-year-old. And she kept on saying in Hebrew, there is really... And he called, I'm so embarrassed of myself that I behaved this way. And he's turning to this Hasidic guy, and she innocently doesn't know that you can't, you know, there's Shomen Nagiyah. She wants to hug him. The same guy that she was screaming stinks. And she tells him, I'm sorry, and I didn't mean it, and I this, and I just got carried away, and it's not yet. And she's like being all apologetic. I tell him, guys, wait one second, please. And I go to my friend who's a flight attendant, and I said, let's be real. We got 12 seats in first class. I'm the only one there. I'm taking all four with me. He's like, do what you got to do. Thanks for solving the problem. So I tell him, yeah, the F applies to all of you. Let's go. <laughs> this story was to have it about 15 years ago, 15 or 16 years ago. I kept in touch with all four people involved. This Hasidic guy later on, when I was speaking to him on the flight, quickly learned, is a Dayan in Jerusalem. Big Talmud Chacham. And that's why he was so worked on that he was able to stay quiet. If they would have done that to somebody else, he would have blown up. It wouldn't be funny what would have happened. He was an extremely worked on holy man. Today, I'm, until today, I'm one of his big supporters to his institutions. And these three girls, three for three, are Shomer Torah and Mitzvot. Two out of three out of all places in the world live in Bnei Brak. The city of the, Has, the Hasid that they yelled at. 
Did it come from Kirov? No, I never preach. I never told him to keep one mitzvah in my life. It comes from one thing, Avat Yisrael. We talk to people on their level. You love them for who they are. Even when they're doing crazy things, everything works out. Kvar ifticha Torah. The Torah promised, Yisrael osim tshuva, that the whole Kali is going to do tshuva. You know how? Because we're going to eradicate sinat chinam, and by definition, nobody will ever have to do any, sin, any sins anymore. Umiyadem nigalim, awosim ashiach tzitkenu, bimeravi amenu, amen, v'amen, shabbat shalom, uvorach.